So I don't understand the obsession, uh, this anti-Semitic, anti-Israel obsession at places like the ICC, at places like the UN. Look, I mean, the United Nations was the body in which, you know, a, you know, the General Assembly in 1975 declared Zionism is racism. And that was a huge, you know, a discredit to the United Nations. It was a big political issue in this country. Uh, and, and, and there was a huge backlash. Uh, and I think that you know, you could see sort of the, the backlash against these international institutions that are, you know, inherently and systemically biased toward, toward against Israel. Welcome to the Michelle Tafoya podcast. Josh Krauschauer is a friend of the show. He is a commentator on Fox. He does radio. He does television. He's with Jewish Insider. And I thought, what better guest to discuss what's been going on in the world? on campuses with anti-Israeli protests, now with this international criminal court issuing arrest warrants for Benjamin Netanyahu, as well as leaders of Hamas. We're in a, maybe not uncharted territory. We're in territory, though, that is new to a lot of people and that is astonishing. And with Josh writing for Jewish Insider, I think it's a, he's a perfect guest. We're also going to talk a little sports at the end. But stick around. Josh Krauschauer is a really knowledgeable, really well-read, really uh, well-researched guy, um, but a very level-headed one as well, uh, very even keeled in terms of his point of view. So this will be this will be good. What does he have to say about Amal Clooney being part of this whole effort to arrest Benjamin Netanyahu? That is coming up next. Josh Krauschauer, welcome back. It's great to see you. It's been fun following your X feed because you've got everything from why rock and roll remains the most beloved music to, you know, today's topic, the ICC. How are you? Michelle, it's great to be back on the show and uh, great to talk uh, politics, sports, anything, and the many things going on uh, this week. It's, it's been a, a crazy busy week. It has. Um, and given that you're with Jewish Insider, it's it's got to be just exploding with activity. Uh, and I want to begin with the International Criminal Court and these arrest warrants for Benjamin Netanyahu and for the leaders of Hamas as as war criminals. What happened here? Well, look, uh, the... <laughs> It's for, it's important to remember that both the United States and 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 and, and Israel are not members are not uh, subject to sort of the purview of, of the ICC, which is an international tribunal in, in the Netherlands. Um, there, there's you know, as you well know, Michelle, there's a big debate both in the U.S. and Israel over how much the U.S. should cede to international institutions to, to these international bodies. The United Nations has been uh, when it comes to uh, Israel, when it comes to national security issues surrounding Israel, has been very biased uh, against against the Jewish state and, and, and obsessed in a way uh, with Israel in a way that it doesn't focus on other countries. Um, look, they they put out a warrant um, against both uh, the Prime Minister of Israel Netanyahu and the Defense Minister Yoav Gallant. They also um, you know, put out a, a, a warrant for, for several Hamas leaders. But the, the outrage, as you can imagine, Michelle, that it's not just partisan. President Biden, Secretary of State yeah. Blink Blinken, Democrats, Republicans are outraged at the notion that a, a country fighting for its survival, a country fighting against terrorism is held on the same plane as a terrorist group that massacred um, 1,200 plus civilians, Israelis, and 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 are holding currently to this day, uh, you know, nearly 300 hostages. Like the notion that you put on the same moral plane, um, and you're putting a warrant out for for the Israeli Prime Minister and the Israeli Defense Minister um, at a time when they're fighting a war for their very survival and their very citizen safety it strikes most uh, Americans and certainly our political leadership as as obscene. And and I think the question now, really, I mean, you you've seen a universality in the United States um, on both with it, from both parties that this is. Outrageous. I think that was the line that Tony Blinken used yesterday. The question is, is there any policy? Is there any legislation to, you know, sanction the ICC to distance the United States from the ICC? That That's the bigger question going forward. Um, you know, and, and, and as for Israel, like there's a question of whether, you know, if Netanyahu goes to a country under sort of the ICC kind of purview, could there be a risk of, a, of, a, of an arrest or a warrant? Um, you know, the, the double standard, though, for, for Israel and these international bodies, we've seen this all over uh, and everything from, you know, the ICC, the UN, 
Um, you know, the, the trial in South Africa that took place a couple months ago, uh, the double standard and the focus and obsession they have against Israel, which is fighting in self-defense versus the terrorist organizations like Hamas that don't seem to have that same degree of scrutiny. Before we get away from this topic, because I want to drill down on why, <laughs> why there is such a double standard, but I, I, we can't ignore the Amal Clooney impact here. She helped write these warrants or at least lobbied for them, you know, married to George Clooney. Um, what, what is, what is her involvement? Why is, is she doing this? So Amal Clooney is a very prominent uh, British human rights lawyer. She's frequently appeared before the, the IC, uh, the ICJ uh, in, in the Hague. And, and so she, she certainly has the ear of, of a lot of the, 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 the leadership. Yeah. I mean, the, the, there's a question of like, you know, given her stature, um, uh, and, 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 uh, relationship with George Clooney that, you know, maybe, maybe that, that, that she was able to make, be, make a persuasive argument behind the scenes. But I, I don't think there's been a whole lot of evidence that's been presented so far to that case. Well, I'm always happy to take a moment to talk about my friends at besthotgrill.com. Besthotgrill.com. All right, so what is this? This is the last grill you're ever going to need to buy. And it's the best gift you could give at Father's Day or graduation. So a lot of special events coming up soon. And besthotgrill.com recommends the gifts of great grilling and healthy eating. So if you have a dad or a grad or a mom that you want to honor, do it with a gift that will be used. It'll also be unforgettable. It'll be the gift that they never forget and they always say gosh that was the best gift i ever got and it's a it's a truly hot gift as well and that would be a solaire infrared grill from besthotgrill.com solaire infrared grills heat up to 1000 degrees in 3 minutes i'm not kidding i don't care where you live or what the climate is and they produce juicy tasty food unmatched by conventional grills I'm here to tell you that I have one, and it is true. It is the best tasting stuff you will ever grill. You might also be taking to the road or having a staycation this summer. Solaire has hot and fast portable built-in and cart models to help you step up your grilling no matter where you are. All Solaire infrared grills are made in the USA and built to last, but more importantly, Solaire infrared grills deliver the wow that everybody likes to receive in a gift or a major purchase. Learn more about the amazing Solaire infrared grills at besthotgrill.com, besthotgrill.com, Solaire infrared gift giving at besthotgrill.com. I can't recommend them enough. So I don't understand the obsession, um, this anti-Semitic, anti-Israel obsession at places like the ICC, at places like the UN, and certainly at universities now, which, boy, we've seen that, Josh. And I know a lot of people don't understand it. So for those of us who don't get it, what is the origin of this hatred? Well, boy, we have the whole show to, to talk about sort of the, 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 the history of, sure. of anti-Israel activity in the UN or, or anti-Semitism in the world. There's a lot, lot to, to tackle. Look, I mean, the United Nations was the body in which, you know, a, you know, the General Assembly in 1975 declared Zionism is racism. And that was a huge, you know, a discredit to the United Nations. It was a big political issue in this country. Uh, and, and, and there was a huge backlash. Uh, and I think that, you know, you could see sort of the, the backlash against these international institutions that are, you know, inherently and systemically biased toward, toward against Israel. Look, uh, th th yeah. there's a lot, lot of reasons why. I mean, every, in the General Assembly, every country gets a vote. Not every country in the General Assembly in the United Nations is a democracy. So you have a lot of countries who, um, and Israel is, frankly, a very small country that, you know, depends on uh, support from the United States and, and, and the close alliance between the two countries to, to, to maintain its security in a very hostile uh, neck of the woods in the Middle East. So, um, look, I think the bigger development, Michelle, is, you know, in this country, uh, we've seen the college campuses uh, some of the top college campuses erupt in sort of not just anti-Semitism, but slogans from Hamas and Hezbollah, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Th these are like very, very, um, uh, you know, eliminationist rhetoric, uh, anti-Semitic rhetoric that are coming from some of the best and brightest, supposedly, uh, in, in this country. So, I mean, that's one of the things that I think has been the biggest 
uh, political development over the last uh, seven months that we knew that like, yeah, there are a lot of countries where, you know, they're, they're, they're not not friendly to the Jewish state, to put it mildly. But in this country, there's always been overwhelming support, bipartisan support uh, for, for Israel, for its safety and security. And you've seen among younger Americans, Gen Z, especially college campuses, you don't just have an anti-Israel activity, but you have sort of the, the, the this terrorist rhetoric, uh, into pro-intifada rhetoric stemming from some of our most elite institutions. Uh, we've talked about that a lot on this show because it's staggering to me. Uh, and I, I, for, for you, it's got to be doubly staggering. And so when you look at Harvard and NYU and George Washington and USC and UCLA, and you're seeing all of this anti-Semitism, this rhetoric, um, it, we, we could trace back the decades to when it might have begun to infiltrate these higher places of higher learning. But are we importing some of it as well? I mean, it, it can't just, it seems to me there are a number of professors who have brought in who are anti-Israeli. Well, look, that, that, that's been going on for, I mean, the, there's so many different factors into why all of a sudden, Michelle, that the, you've seen this spike of uh, hostility towards Israel that was always, I mean, on campuses especially, there were always professors that, that were uh, anti-Israel. They were anti-American. I mean, they're, 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 that's not something yeah. new to the academy. I would posit a few things. Um, number one, social media uh, has taken off in the last decade. Everyone now has a smartphone. The world is flatter than before. Uh, if you're in Iran, that you can communicate. For your, if, you're in, if you're in any part of the world that may not be particularly friendly to the United States or to Israel or to Western values, you can easily, you know, get your message out on, on all the platforms. You know, TikTok, which is the most popular platform by a general you know young, the youngest americans it's owned by by the by, by the by china by the by the chinese communist party i mean the the, the notion that we would uh have a, a major news organization or news it's not really a news organization but a, a place where people get their news owned by a by a hostile power 30 years ago would have been unthinkable and yet that is a, a major major right. platform um, and we now know that Congress has been taking action against against TikTok and its ownership. So that's one big thing that that you have people getting their news from less reliable sources from uh, China, <laughs> from from, you know, you know, sort of platforms that are that are hostile to American interests. You also, I think, have uh, an issue in the university where, where what used to be sort of a liberal, a, a strongly liberal institution has now become an institution where a lot of radicals, a lot of lot of leftist uh, type type thinkers have been uh, promoted, you know, taken over certain important departments. So there's not a lot of diversity intellectually at many of these elite universities. We're, we're seeing that in, in real time that that you have faculty members that are protesting and, and look, protest you know, people should be able to protest and and and, yeah. and 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 say what they believe that that's perfectly fine. But the type of rhetoric, the radicalism, the anti-Americanism. Um, and, and the anti-Semitism is sort of un un unbelievable. And some of it is coming from not just the students themselves, but from faculty members. And, and I don't think there's been a lot of uh, good stewardship uh, of, of, of many universities. People assumed you go to Harvard, you got the, you know, you got the, the brand uh, of being a Harvard graduate, but no one was paying as close attention to what was being taught inside those schools. So, you know, we, we it's interesting that not every school is alike. Duke, Duke University, which is a pretty... Uh, liberal institution, but actually, if you look at the data, has a more di a slightly more diverse student body than Harvard and uh, Penn and Brown and some of these other schools. They have not had the same degree of, of, of problems that a lot of the other institutions have had because they do have uh, more moderation in, in their faculty and student body. Um, so a lot of that is the fact that universities just basically hire the same people who think the same. So you have to sign these DEI statements these days at a lot of schools where you have okay. to commit to believing a certain worldview. So there's been an ideological monoculture taking place at the university level. And a lot of it is is, is very uh, left wing when it comes to uh, foreign policy and certainly when it comes to Israel. Do you think it would be a fair policy to to take away federal funding or is that too drastic? Well, look, there's, there's been some discussion in Congress about the endowments that, that these universities have and their tax status. Um, I think that kind of nips at the edges. I think that that's not certain that that, that certainly um, is an issue. But I don't think that that really is dealing with the systemic nature of some of the problems that, that we're facing at the university level. Look, I think the biggest uh, the most significant impact that's happened, especially in the last few months, is when you kind of shine a light, politically speaking, on what's taking place uh, on these universities. Um, you know, in my backyard here in Washington, D.C., 
there were these, uh, you know, encampments at George Washington University saying some of the most yeah. vile things. There were people making death threats to the university leadership, and they were doing no nothing about it. And it got to the point where the university president was begging the mayor, begging the uh, D.C. police department to, to clear out this encampment. Um, nothing happened until the House, uh, the, the relevant Republican how led House subcommittee said, we're going to have a hearing and bring the mayor, bring 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 the, the police chief to Capitol Hill to explain why they're not doing anything to deal with this encampment that was, you know, espousing pro uh, Hamas type type rhetoric. And what happened, Michelle, the, the next actually that night, the night before the hearing, the, the police cleared out the encampment and, and dealt with the problem. So, you know, I, I my, what we've been covering this a lot of the campus uh, controversies left and right. Uh, but we've noticed that like whenever you have the university presidents coming before the hearing, having to defend what's going on at their institutions, that is when you actually get movement. That That's what actually affects change. It, you know, the other, other policy proposals or legislation certainly nips around the edges, but some of this stuff is so politically toxic, Michelle. Anyone who sees it on their television is uh, kind of disgusted by what's going on. If you have a kid in college, you're wondering what the heck is going on there. Um, that, that just shining that political light uh, actually builds a bipartisan degree of support to actually challenging and taking on some of this excess. You know, really, the entire democracy is built around one thing. That's freedom of speech, the First Amendment. It's the cornerstone that supports every single freedom that we have and enjoy in this country. But here we are in a digital age and discussions about our wealth, our rights and our future are being silenced or overshadowed in mainstream narratives. And that leaves a lot of us feeling like we don't really have a voice in the conversations that are crucial to our independence, our financial independence and our security. And this is where Wealth Protection Research steps in. They are armed with a mission that's, honestly, it's never been more critical. Wealth Protection Research isn't a financial advisory firm. They're defenders of free speech. They're committed to giving a voice to the silenced. Wealth Protection Research tirelessly seeks out financial experts. Now, these are the voices that challenge the prevailing narratives out there, especially as we navigate the uncertainties of the 2024 election. Wealth Protection Research has created a 2024 Election Wealth Protection Report. This is a free report that highlights the three best ideas for protecting and growing your money heading into the 2024 election. It contains ideas the mainstream media won't touch, and you can get it completely free by texting IDEAS, I-D-E-A-S, to 76626 to claim your free copy. If you believe, as I do, in the sanctity of free speech and the importance of financial freedom, act now. Text IDEAS to 76626 to claim your free copy of this 2024 election protection report. It's time to widen the scope of what we're told, to hear the ideas the establishment doesn't think you can handle, but you can. And take control of our financial destinies. Text IDEAS to 76626 to claim your free copy. Do it now. So this has been a massive, uh, just a PR nightmare for these for these campuses. But how do you think this this whole anti-Israeli, this pro-Hamas, this all of these movements are going to move things in November regarding the election? So I, I don't think this is going to be the top issue when it comes to what you hear from Donald Trump or Joe Biden. I mean, this is something that's dividing the Democratic Party between the left wing of the party and the more traditional wing of the Democratic Party. But where I think that especially the, the anti-Israel protests, the cases of anti-Semitism on campus where it does have a political impact is it you just see scenes of chaos. You, you see sort of the disorder taking place and President Biden ran his first campaign. His main message, the reason he got into this race initially was to be the, the person who was going to bring order and normalcy back to the country. Uh, and anyone, I mean, look, the, we know about inflation still, still elevated and still putting the hurt in a lot of people's pocketbooks. We see the border and, 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 the, and the issues with border security that have, that have gone, uh, you know, un unfixed. Um, and, and then people see, look, 
college campuses, which are supposed to be a haven of learning and where, you know, many parents are going to be thinking about sending their kids and it's, it's, it's front and center on their minds. And they're seeing these scenes of disorder and chaos. And that goes against Biden's central brand uh, of, of sort of the, when he, again, first got elected, he's the guy who's the middle of the Democratic Party who's going to bring sort of normalcy back to the country. Well, Donald Trump, as the opponent, as the challenger, has an easy comeback, uh, and, and he has been using it in his 2024 campaign, which is, you know, everything's in chaos. You need to have, uh, you need to bring me back into, you know, we need to elect me again to kind of return things to where they were before, which is, you know, it's kind of amazing when you think about it because Donald Trump ran during the height of COVID. You know, there was a lot of chaos back then, the street, you know, George, the the wake of the George Floyd murder in June of 2020. But I think a lot of people thought Biden was going to fix a lot of that, that chaos. And we're seeing with what's going on in, in many certainly many college towns and cities across the country. That's not been the case. In fact, it feels as though the chaos has been amplified and multiplied. And it, you can go back to the withdrawal from Afghanistan. That was sort of the first major bit of chaos that we witnessed as a country. And uh, so, so, so chaos seems to be the order of the day. And I think people are really tired of it. So clearly you've got your ear to the ground regarding all of the issues that people are interested in. And somehow the Democrats managed to pull abortion into every political election cycle. How much is it going to play, do you think, this time around? Well, look, abortion is going to be a big issue. It's certainly one of the most effective issues Democrats can run on. Uh, And you have decisions that have been made by individual Republican legislatures and Wisconsin and Arizona, where they've taken positions restricting abortion that go beyond even where a lot of pro-life voters are. Um, You know, the Arizona case was a good, I think, example of where, you know, you're talking about a swing state and there was um, a vote where most Republicans, though not all, ended up wanting to preserve essentially an 1860s law that that essentially restricted uh, almost all, if not all, um, it was a very, very uh, restrictive law that was not supported by, by many Arizonans. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a challenge. It's one that Democrats are going to be talking a heck of a lot about. Now, it's not the most important issue, in, in, if you believe the polls. The economy is probably the number one issue. Immigration is, is just as high as abortion is. And that's an, equal, uh, that's an issue that's equally a vulnerability for, for the Democratic Party. I also think that in a lot of, um, you know, it, certainly in swing states where abortion policy is hanging in the balance, that, that's an issue that Democrats are going to really drive home. A lot of blue states, a lot of a lot of states across the country where, you know, abortion policy isn't really up for grabs, that they, they have liberal governors or, 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 or pro-choice leaders, um, you know, like Pennsylvania, for example, you have a Democratic governor um, and, and Democrats hold part of the, the state control part of the state legislature that is um, le- less at stake. I mean, there, there's going to be less less hanging in the balance um, this year, at least. So. Look, I mean, abortion is going to be one of the few issues that Democrats feel like they, they can go on offense uh, about. But I think that if they only talk about abortion and don't talk about the economy, don't talk about immigration, don't talk about crime, don't talk about sort of the, the foreign policy issues, creating a, a sense of unease across the country, they're, they're not going to be able to win over a lot of the, 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 the persuadable voters. So I was very excited when my friend Jennifer Say, the former uh, president of Levi's, decided she was going to start her own clothing line, XXXY Athletics. I couldn't wait to get my first shipment because I wanted to see what it was like. And I was stoked. I was really psyched because it is so high quality, great looking. The styles are great. But more importantly, I get to wear stuff that aligns with my values. So Jennifer Say, you may know, um, ended up losing her spot at Levi's because she spoke out against the school closures during COVID. She made some very unpopular statements at the time. She ended up being proven right. And uh, she also was a world-class gymnast, uh, gymnast growing up. And she spoke out. She was one of the first people to talk about the abuses these gymnasts were enduring. And she paid for it. And she ended up being right. So she is someone who stands up for the things she believes in and XXXY Athletics is the culmination of everything she's ever done. She is not afraid. She is fearless. She says true but unpopular things. She takes the heat. And now it's about girls and women's sports. Girls and women's sports. Joe Biden has taken a torch to Title IX 
And Jennifer Say is one of those voices helping fight back. Check out XXXY Athletics. I'm telling you, you're going to love the quality and the style, and you'll be choosing a brand that aligns with your values. Here's how you find it. XX-XYAthletics.com. So when you type that into your search engine, it is xx-xyathletics.com. Use Michelle75 to get free shipping on orders of $75 or more. Michelle75. Go to xxxy, again, put that dash in there, xx-xyathletics.com. Don't forget that dash. Use Michelle75 for free shipping on orders of $75 or more. That's good through June. Support the cause and have great clothing to go along with it. How many persuadable voters do you think there are right now? It seems like we're all stuck in our corners. So, Michelle, I, I think the bigger question is who's going to stay home and who's going to vote? Mm-hmm. Um, that, 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 I, I think there's not that many people who are, you know, looking at and listening to the show and they're like, not, not, not sure of who they're going to vote for. I think most people have probably locked in their uh, decisions. Um, we have a re- one of the... The, the very few times in American history we, we're going to have a rematch between a president and a former president. People know what they think about both Joe Biden and Donald Trump. But the biggest question is who's going to vote for Joe, Donald Trump and who's going to stay home on the couch? Who's going to vote for Joe Biden? Who might vote third party uh, for Robert F. Kennedy or for uh, Cornell West or, or any of the other uh, Jill Stein, you know, other, other third party candidates? Uh, turnout was historic in the 2020 and 2016 elections. There's a lot of indications right. that a lot of people are more apathetic, that may not vote. And, and Donald Trump, I think that he may have more at stake when it comes to turnout in this election, because uh, Democrats have shown that in these local elections, these congressional elections, the midterms, you know, dog catcher in, 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 in your local town, Democrats are voting. They're, they're voting and they're actually winning a lot of these local elections. Uh, midterms, they, they, they overachieved in part because their turnout uh, was so strong. Um, Donald Trump, though, has shown that he has something of an army of voters that just vote for Donald Trump. They, they will show up and come hell or high water, vote for Donald Trump. They've done so in 2016 and 2020. And there is a lot of indications that they may do so again in 2024. So I think the biggest, Michelle, the biggest X factor is going to be whether tr- those voters continue to show up, continue to mobilize as they did in the last two elections, or whether they're just so disgusted with everything going on in politics that they stay home. Well, I do see reports of some of these groups, though, shifting African-American men shifting toward the Republican Party, uh, Latinos shifting toward the Republican Party. Uh, do you think that that's just not enough of a shift to make a difference? Yeah. So the the, the big question is we, we saw small shifts between 2016 and 2020 uh, in terms of Donald Trump picking up a little more support with African-American men mostly. Uh, Hispanic voters um, moved a little bit towards Trump, maybe not as much as I think Republicans were hoping, but definitely are moving uh, in a more Republican direction. So I think the big question is whether there is a a more significant shift or whether the status quo holds. Um, Look, the polls are, if you look at the crosstabs and and you really dive, dive deep into some of these national polls, it is pretty stunning that Trump can be winning. Uh, I think the the Fox News poll that came out this past week showed Trump winning over 20 percent of the African-American vote, which would be a historically high showing for any Republican in a presidential election. Uh, Now, other other pollsters and strategists think, you know, you know, the polling may be a little little bullish on on, on that that prospect. But look, if that that happens, if if Trump wins 20 percent of the African-American vote, game over. I mean, that, that, that is the, the heart of the Democratic coalition. And if even a, a sizable minority or a notable minority of uh, younger black voters or black male voters defect, uh, it would be a, a death blow to Biden's reelection chances. All right. What about the chances of the Wolves and the Dallas Mavericks? I know you're following the NBA. Uh, who do you like? Uh, so it's, I, I always root against the Lakers on the Western conference. So that, that, um, that got resolved. That was taken kind of, care of for you. Yeah. Then. Um, look, I, I like, I hope the T wolves, I mean, they, you know, it's, it's sort of, I'm not, a, you know, you have Kyrie on the Mavericks. Who's easy to hate. You've got a rod about to own the T wolves. I know Michelle, you're, I'm, you're a big T wolves fan, I'm sure. So, um, you know, look, 
I, I probably would like to see some fresh blood in the in the NBA Finals, so I'm, I'm probably going to be pulling for the the Timberwolves. I was rooting for the the Knicks in the Eastern Conference. Um, I think ESPN was <laughs> a little too much, maybe rooting for the Knicks, um, <laughs> watching their pregame show. But look, I I, I think um, I think Minnesota is a, a good a good young team, and it's stunning to see the turnaround over the last few years. Well, it's going to be fun regardless. Uh, that last that game seven with the Nuggets and the Timberwolves was like nothing I'd ever seen, and it was almost hard to believe. So we'll hope that that kind of energy, that kind of unpredictability continues uh, in the finals, in the Western Conference finals. Josh, it's always great to see you. Thank you so much for your insights. And uh, as I finish every podcast, every time I say, be brave, do good, just do a little good, have a little courage out there in the world, folks. And uh, we thank Josh for, for coming on. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Michelle. Great being on.